Good morning. Please open your Bibles to Luke, probably chapter 4 would be as good a place as any. And this Sunday morning, we will continue our um, survey of major themes in the Gospel of Luke. This will be part two. There'll be a part three and a part four, and then I promise we will at last be done with Luke's Gospel. Um, But there are some really central themes. I think it can be helpful, having looked at the trees individually, to stand back and look at the forest. This morning, I want to consider the centrality of the Word of God in Luke. Luke's approach to and use of Scripture, and what Luke reveals in his presentation of Jesus, and how Jesus approaches the Bible. I think it's incredibly helpful. Um, and, and I want you to, if you have any friends or family who would name the name of his Christian, but are of more liberal stripe, one of the issues you probably run up against is their charge that we're too literalist, or we have made an idol of the Bible. I need mean, to take that seriously. Um, I hear that frequently when I talk to um, some sects of, of Christianity. And so I think it's helpful again and again to check our approach to Scripture. Is it coming out of the Bible, or are we reading it into it? Um, Is our use of Scripture consistent with Jesus' use of Scripture, with the writer's use of Scripture? So I just want to look purely on internal evidence, Luke's own use, Luke's own treatment, and what we learn about Jesus and his use of Scripture. And is the way we're reading the Bible, and is the way we're interpreting the Bible, and is the way we're reverencing the Bible fit with, comport with Jesus? That's an important point to make. One of the things I'll frequently say when I'm challenged by um, Christians of a more liberal, um, looser approach is, look, I just want to read my Bible like Jesus reads his Bible. I just want to follow right in his footsteps. And they can throw out um, inerrancy as a post-enlightenment construct and say, I am a simple man. And I just want to read my Bible like Jesus reads his Bible. By the way, that charge is ridiculous. Modernism and the Enlightenment are anti-supernaturalism. So the thought that arising out of that would come this magic view of inerrancy is ludicrous. Um, But you don't need to say that. You can say, look, you don't need to respond to that stuff. I just want to try to read my Bible like Jesus reads his Bible. And for those of us who claim to be Jesus followers, fair enough. Let me look to the New Testament. Because remember, it's the same Gospels that give us the Sermon on the Mount, the turn the other cheek, the love your neighbors yourself, which so many of a more liberal type love. Those same Gospels give us the Jesus who uses Scripture. So we're going to look at that this morning in six points. I've just left them sort of free with some space to write things in. These should be in somewhat familiar grounds. I'd like to dive in before we start our six points by just making some observations about Luke himself. And that is this. Bear in mind, Luke himself is a Gentile writing to a Gentile. Almost certainly Luke is a Gentile. And Theophilus certainly is. Not least of which because of their their Greek names. But in Acts 119, Luke, writing to Theophilus, translates a term which he says in their language means making it clear Theophilus is not part of that group, and even strongly suggesting that Luke himself, not in our language, but in their language, there's more wiggle room there potentially. So there's a Gentile writing to a Gentile. And yet we find, second point, Luke's gospel contains over 24 direct citations of the Old Testament. And citations are easier to track. What becomes much more difficult is allusions. Because who's to say what text is alluding to what text? One author I read, who's fairly reputable, found over 23 different allusions. An allusion is when you reference. You're not directly quoting. You're you're referencing something. In Mary's Magnificat alone, from the 10 verses of Mary's Song of Praise, one author found 23 distinct allusions to Scripture. So Luke's gospel is, is saturated with what we call the Old Testament. That's another thing to bear in mind. As we talk about Luke's use of Scripture, talking about Luke's use of the Old Testament, Jesus' use of the Old Testament, another thing that's popular today and, and some speakers have suggested is distancing ourselves or unhitching ourselves from the Old Testament. The God of the Old Testament does some, some strange things that become difficult to defend, it is said. So rather than taking that burden upon ourselves... Why not just focus on the New Testament? Well, the New Testament is built upon the Old Testament. And everything we're going to see about Jesus' view and use of Scripture is him viewing and using what we call the Old Testament. 
So again, I want to read my Old Testament like Jesus reads his Old Testament. I want to value my Old Testament like Jesus values his Old Testament. I do not see Jesus unhitching from the Old Testament. With those preparatory remarks, let's dive in six points. First, Jesus' life, death, and resurrection are in fulfillment of Scripture. Fulfilled Scripture. Um, This this is the bookends of Luke's gospel, Jesus' very first declaration of public ministry. In Luke chapter 4, if you have indeed turned there, he is baptized, he goes out, he's tempted in the wilderness, he returns to his home synagogue. Verse 16, he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and as was his custom, he went on the synagogue, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day. He stood up to read. The scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll, found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives, the recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll, and he gave it back to the attendant, and sat down, and the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today... This scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. What Jesus is clearly saying is this prophecy about the Lord's servant who would be Messiah anointed in this way, given this commission, is fulfilled in him. I am the fulfillment of this passage. That's what Jesus is saying. Jump to the end of Luke, Luke 24. In Luke 24, how does Luke's gospel close? Jesus shows up incognito on the road to Emmaus. And in 24, 25, he said to them, a foolish ones and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. And, and so what we're getting from this is that the Old Testament is about Jesus. It, it, it predicts and informs us about Jesus and and the rebuke here is if they had rightly understood the Old Testament they would have rightly understood him they've misunderstood him they they view him as a crucified and potentially failed Messiah we had hoped they said that Jesus would deliver us and the people and so there's direct continuity Jesus ministry he understands it Luke understands it is in fulfillment completion of prophecies in the Old Testament And again, Jesus says to the disciples, having convinced them of his resurrection, look at verse 44. Then he said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. See, Jesus understood every bit of his ministry, every bit of his work here on earth as a fulfillment of the Old Testament scriptures. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And again, he's preparing the disciples for the work they'll carry out in the book of Acts. And one of the necessary um, tools of preparation they needed was a better understanding of the Old Testament, the scriptures. He opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, Thus it is written that Christ should suffer, and the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance for forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. So... The first point, this shouldn't be too controversial for us, and this probably wouldn't even be too controversial in, in, in more um, liberal Christian circles, is that Jesus' life, death, and resurrection are the fulfillment of predictions made in the Old Testament. There is continuity. What the Old Testament predicted, Jesus fulfills. Okay, let's move on to our second point. Now turn to Luke 2. You want to read your Bible like Jesus reads his Bible. You want to treat your Bible like Jesus treats his Bible. Well, Jesus dedicated himself to the study of Scripture. Jesus dedicated himself to the study of Scripture. This is quite notable. Luke's gospel is the only gospel that contains an account of Jesus where he speaks and acts prior to his baptism. The other gospels may contain birth narratives where Jesus is acted upon. He's taken down to Egypt. But this is the only place we have... Or prior to Jesus' baptism and the formal beginning of his public ministry, Jesus speaks and acts. And it's when he's left behind in Jerusalem. Remember, his family went up for the feast in Luke chapter 2. And Luke, I want you to see this section. It's from verse 40 to 52. 
Uh, and I've mentioned this before, but Luke sets it apart as a literary unit. And the way we know that is he bookends it. The, the literary term is called inclusio. And it's when you basically say something very similar at the beginning at the end. It lets you know both that we've set off a unit and it gives you an insight into the major theme of that unit. So look at 40. Chapter 2, verse 40. The child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. Look at 52. And Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and with man. You see how they're very, very similar. That's how we know we're dealing with a unit. And so in this unit, I would expect to see Jesus growing in wisdom. Jesus growing in favor with God and with man. And this is, of course, the, the story where they go up. The family goes up in a big caravan with the cousins and everybody to Jerusalem for the feast. And they leave. And after three days, they finally found Jesus who's been lost. And he's in the temple. And what is he doing? Look at verse 46. After three days, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. Now, if you want to look at this more deeply, we're going to deal with this briefly here. You can go back to the message in our sermon archive on this text. But there I suggested that there's only two ways of viewing this. You can either view Jesus here as setting these teachers straight, correcting them. He is he's holding court, shutting them down. I don't think that's the way we should read this. That's one option. The other is what I suggest is going on. Jesus here is learning. He's listening. What are we told? He's sitting. That's, that's a respectful seat. He's sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. And when his parents saw him, they were astonished. So Jesus is growing in favor. If he were rebuking and correcting them, I don't think he'd be growing in favor with man. Perhaps with God, but not with man. But I think what Luke wants us to see here is this 12-year-old boy is aggressively, hungrily studying the scripture. When he gets to Jerusalem and he has access to some of the most learned scholars and teachers, they can accelerate his learning of scripture. Now, because remember, Jesus in Luke's gospel and Jesus as he lived this life on earth is not, my term, functionally omniscient. What I mean by functionally omniscient is he's not acting as though he always knows all things all the time. So a woman touches him. He says, who touched me? He says, I don't know the, the, the hour that I return. Jesus evidently in the gospels is lacking knowledge. Now we know he's God. So what I'm saying is he's simply not utilizing. He's not using. He's not actively operating in omniscience in the gospels. And if you deny that, you're going to end up with what sort of the Roman Catholics can sometimes have, where Jesus, still with the umbilical cord attached, is teaching people in the, in the uh, birth scene. So either he comes into the world fully omniscient, knowing everything. He's, he's the newborn baby who's talking and teaching. Or like you and like me, he learned. He learned perfectly. He never learned an error. He never made a mistake. But he learned. I think that's what Luke wants us to see. This is Jesus day and night in the temple studying his father's word, studying the scriptures. And if that's accurate, if this is a picture of Jesus learning, then one of the other striking things to consider is Jesus one day, we don't know when, had to learn who he was from scripture. I believe Jesus, through his study of the scripture, understood what it meant that he was the Messiah, what it meant that he was the son of God, learned what his mission must be of dying on the cross, all through his study of scripture. And so all we know is that by the time he's 12 years old, Jesus has, in fact, come to the identity of who he is. That's the crucial wordplay in um, chapter 2, when his mother says to him, Verse 48, son, why have you treated us so? Behold, your father and I have been searching for you in great distress. And he said to them, why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? So 12-year-old Jesus is studying day and night in the temple as he has opportunity. And 12-year-old Jesus already knows who his real father is. And I believe he's learned that through a study of scripture. And the reason why I want to highlight that is this. If you turn over to chapter um, 20, one of the things we see in Luke's gospel, in fact, in all the gospels, is that once Jesus enters into his formal ministry, from day one of his formal ministry, he's been baptized by John, he's on mission, he has mastered the Bible. He has mastered the Old Testament. 
And in every single encounter with other people, they try to trap him or trip him up or ask him scriptural questions. He is always seen as the master of the text. And Luke no differently shows that. You remember the conflicts in the temple in the week that he's in the temple prior to the crucifixion. And it culminates with verse 39 of chapter 20. Then some of the scribes answered, teacher, you have spoken well, for they no longer dared ask him any questions. Now, here's the point. We are wrong, I think, if we credit that as, well, of course, he's God. I think Luke wants us to credit to, of course, he studied diligently as a youth. The fruit of Jesus' intense focused, zealous study of God's word way back when he was 12 years old, the results of that faithfulness are seen here where he silences his opposition. And of course, if that's what Luke wants us to see, then as much as Jesus is put forward as a model for us to follow after in his steps, if the sinless son of God need to dedicate hours upon hours, so much so that he could spend three days and three nights studying the word of God, how much more you and me? In fact, when you consider the point that you have in the blank up there that Luke's gospel contains 24 direct citations of the Old Testament, Luke was expecting Theophilus to track with them. Theophilus is a Gentile. What does that imply about Luke's assumptions of Theophilus' own reading and studying of the Old Testament? Luke writes a letter with 24 citations directly of the Old Testament, hundreds of allusions to the Old Testament, to a Gentile who he has to tell what Jewish terms mean, and yet he clearly expects Theophilus to be able to follow him. What does that show about his assumptions of Theophilus's reading and studying of the Old Testament? Remember, this isn't the first time Theophilus has heard this. Luke's writing to give him certainty about the things he's heard. So Theophilus is presumably some form of Christ follower. Luke's gospel gets written to give certainty. And so what does that mean for us? We need to give ourselves to the rigorous, intense, focused study of the word. This is not simply simply something for pastors and Sunday school teachers. This is something for Christians. God's word birthed you, and we are to feed on it like newborn babes. My children, when they're newborn, don't just get hungry once a week on Sunday. They're crying out for food by the hour. And we, like newborn children, also need to study God's word. We need to give it a priority. It's, it's a cop-out to say, well, of course Jesus mastered it. He's God. No, Luke sh- shows us how and why we're supposed to conclude Jesus mastered the Bible. And it's because of accounts like what we see in Luke chapter 2. Jesus dedicated himself to the study of Scripture. So again, going back to that question, are we reading our Bible like Jesus? You are reading your Bible like Jesus. If you too are dedicating yourself to its study, if you are devouring it, feeding upon it regularly, intensely, then yes, you are doing exactly like our Lord did. Um, Point three. Building upon point two, Jesus relied upon the scripture to fight temptation. Turn to Luke four. Jesus relied upon the scripture to fight temptation. And again, if the sinless son of God relied upon scripture as he was tempted by the devil, how much more you and I, you know, that, you know, the text, Luke four. Start in verse 1, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan, was led by the Spirit into the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by the devil. And he ate nothing during those days, and when they were ended, he was hungry. And the devil said to him, if you are the Son of God, command this stone to become bread. And Jesus answered him, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone. And then the devil tempts him a second time, verse 8, it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him. And then the third time, in verse 12, Jesus responds, um, It is said, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Now, Jesus quotes Deuteronomy, the book of Deuteronomy, three times in fighting temptation. I doubt, it's probably not likely you or I have viewed Deuteronomy as a great source for um, power to fight temptation. Jesus did. Jesus studied and memorized 
large portions of Deuteronomy, precisely so Jesus could fight temptation from the devil. Don't, don't unhitch from the Old Testament. Study it, devour it, memorize it, and use it in your fight against, scripture, against temptation. Jesus used scripture to respond to the temptation of the devil. And again, when we study this passage, the things the devil puts in front of Jesus are not implicitly bad. So I do believe he was tempted. He was hungry. He wanted food. When the devil said, make his stones turn to bread, I do believe Jesus wanted food. That was a struggle. It's a struggle he won. He never sinned. But again, we, we cop out if we say, well, it wasn't really temptation. Because if it's not like you're in my temptation, then you and I don't need to follow suit. But if Jesus was tested and tempted in every way as we are yet without sin, as Hebrews 4 says, then again, we have a model to follow. And Jesus not only devoured, studied, mastered God's word, he had it hidden in his heart so that when temptation come, he could quote it, he could speak it to the devil, he could speak it to that temptation and be faithful. So... How are we reading our Bible at Jesus Reads His Bible? We're doing that if we, if we too are devouring it, studying it, mastering it, growing in our mastery of it. We're, we're reading our Bibles like Jesus reads his Bible. If we're memorizing it, hiding it in our hearts, and using it in our fight of temptation. Fourth, Jesus insisted on the unique power of Scripture. Turn to Luke 16. Luke 16. Let's look at one passage. Uh, I think you could show this in many places in Luke's gospel. But the story of the rich man and Lazarus is striking. Um, Jesus is correcting and rebuking the Pharisees. That's the context here. And he's going to challenge that these men who have studied the Bible, who have probably memorized the Old Testament and additional material two or three times as long, He's going to suggest to them that they have too low a view of Scripture. They don't take it seriously enough. There's a rich man who is clothed in purple and fine linen who feasted sumptuously every day. And at this gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who desired to be fed by what fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, even the dogs came and licked his sores. The poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. And in Hades, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. And he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue. So his first instinct is for himself, for some relief. That is denied. But then he makes a second request. Verse 27. Then I beg you, Father, send him, send Lazarus, to my father's house. For I have five brothers, so they may warn them, lest they come to this place of torment. Now just pause. The the rich man's goal is one with which we would agree. Abraham would agree. He doesn't want his brothers also to go to hell. He doesn't want his brothers also to to suffer this torment. I think we'd all agree. Amen. The discussion and the dispute here will purely be about how. What means will we trust in? What will be the power to save men? How will we convince people of the, their need to turn to Christ, to turn to God in faith and repentance? How, how will they be persuaded? And the rich man's plan hinges upon a miraculous sign and miracle. A known deceased individual coming back from the dead to testify about the reality of judgment in the hereafter. That's his strategy. Abraham doesn't buy into that strategy. Verse 27, he said, Then I beg you, Father, to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, so that he may warn them, lest they come into this place of torment. But Abraham said, They have Moses and the prophets. And rather than unhitching, let them hear them. So, Mo, so Abraham's answer is not in any way challenging the desire, purely methodology. We're not going to send Lazarus back from the dead. They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. The rich man pushes back. No, Father Abraham, verse 39, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. Repent. 
Verse 31 is absolutely striking as it indicates Jesus' view of the power and the authority of God's word. He said to him, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. And having completed our study of Luke's gospel, Jesus himself will rise from the dead. And the majority of the Pharisees and those who called out for his blood will still remain unconvinced. They'll just hire soldiers to lie about what happened. But I want you to just pause and think about that. Because even today, we're tempted to think if we can get a big enough Christian celebrity, if we can get a most uh, a, a notable enough expert, if we can just get Chuck Norris or whoever to come. And, and praise God, Chuck Norris professes faith. That's, that's awesome. I'm not in any way trying to minimize that. My point is... We, 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 we can be tempted to put our hope and trust in something other than God's word to be the power to save men. We might look for and long for signs and miracles. You'll hear people say, man, if I could just, you know, have seen what Moses saw, what the Israelites saw. You realize the Israelites saw the Red Sea divide and then rebelled against God and died in the wilderness 40 years later. Jesus is saying no miracle, no matter how powerful, No sign, no great act adds an iota of power or authority to God's word. If they will not believe because of God's word, they will not believe even if someone rises from the dead. That means if we were doing an evangelism crusade at a graveyard and partway through the crusade we stopped, people rose up from the dead and said, he's right, you know. It would do zero. That's what he's saying. We get back to, do we read our Bible like Jesus reads this Bible? Do we view the scripture like Jesus views the scripture? Jesus, quoting Abraham in this story, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. Now you can fill in your blank with any other, neither will they. Neither will they convinced if you get, no matter which celebrity you get. Neither will they be convinced no matter how much you love them. Do love them. Do serve them. Do be kind to them. But at the end of the day, Jesus is saying Scripture and Scripture alone has the power to save. Scripture and Scripture alone has the power to beget life in the soul. According to James, by his own word, he brought us forth as a kind of first fruits. If you're a born-again believer, you are born again by the living and abiding word of God. According to 1 Peter. And so Jesus trusted supremely in the power and the authority for for him was just the Old Testament. And we have so much more. Let's not trust in, we'll be reading our Bibles like Jesus if we too trust in the power and the authority of his word. If we too do not put our trust in other things. God's word spoken by his humblest servant has just as much power and authority as God's word spoken by the most great preacher you can imagine. What that means is if you and I have God's word, we have just as much power and authority, just the same tool set of Spurgeon, of MacArthur, of any of the great preachers of the church. Because This is the power of God's salvation, not my wisdom, my skill, or some other pastor's wisdom or skill. According to Paul, he watered Apollos, uh, he planted, sorry, Apollos watered, God made it grow. So Jesus insisted on the power of scripture. Five, turn to chapter 20, Jesus depended upon the precise accuracy of scripture. And here's the point probably we're going to rub up most with our more liberal Christian friends, they, they generally, in my interaction with these folks, they generally like the, the, the Beatitudes, they like Jesus' moral teaching. Not as big of a fan about Jesus' exclusive teachings. Not as big of a fan about Jesus' teaching on marriage. Certainly not a big fan of Paul. And, and they'll oftentimes accuse me, accuse us of, of taking things too tightly, too literally. Isn't after all, isn't it just the sort of the general gist that matters? I think, I think Jesus would disagree. And again, this is where the simplest answer is, look, I'm just trying to read my Bible. Like Jesus reads his Bible. If you see some contradiction, if you see some inconsistency, show it to me. 
I'm just trying to follow my Lord in the way he reads his Bible. Now, in Luke chapter 20, Jesus goes through six rounds of conflict with the Sadducees and the scribes and the chief priests in the temple. And after silencing them, we saw that in verse 40, right? They no longer dare to ask many questions. He's not done with them. He wants to show the people publicly that these would-be teachers of the law do not understand the things they're teaching. They are not qualified to teach the law. Therefore, do not listen to them. And he is going to silence them further. Simple argument. Look at verse 41. Whose son is the Christ? Now, his argument here is, you guys not only have far too low of scripture, you have far too low a view of who the Messiah will be when he comes. And remember, it's Jesus' claim to be the son of God that will ultimately cause him to be condemned. His claim to divinity, deity. So look at this argument. He said to them, how can they say the Christ is David's son? For David himself says in the book of the Psalms, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Thus David calls him Lord, so how is he his son? Understand, Jesus' argument is citing one verse from Psalm 110. And the argument is this, since David is speaking... And David refers to two people he can rightly call his Lord. The Lord, Yahweh, the Lord God, said to my Lord, sit at my right hand. And and the common, I think, Jewish understanding of that day was that person was the Messiah. Jesus' question is, who is this individual to whom David can refer to him as my Lord? Because the Jewish common understanding was the son is always inferior to the father. We see that logic present in the book of Hebrews when the author of Hebrews argues that Melchizedek's priesthood is greater than the priesthood of Levi because Abraham, with Levi as a manner of speaking, present in his loins, Abraham tithes to Melchizedek, therefore Melchizedek's greater than Abraham, and since Abraham must be greater than his sons, he's greater than Levi, therefore Melchizedek is greater than Levi because Abraham tithed to him. That's the argument of Hebrews. So the assumption is, and it's a biblical assumption, the son is inferior to the father. And they knew the Messiah would come from David's own body. They knew he'd be a descendant of David. And so Jesus says, how then can David speak of his coming descendant, the Messiah, as his Lord? Now I want you to understand something. That entire argument only works because Jesus acknowledges the veracity, the credibility, and the trustworthiness Of the psalm title. This argument only works because Psalm 110 begins of David. Because if it didn't say of David, the answer could be, it's not David writing. It's Asaph. It's Heman the Ezraite. It's any one of the other numerous authors of psalms. And now it's just the Lord said to my Lord, and by Lord, I mean David. Or sure, the Messiah is greater than me. The argument only works... Because of the psalm title. Jesus silences his opposition with arguments from scripture that hinge on tiny points of grammar. Just previously, he'd silenced them about the resurrection because Exodus says from the burning bush, I am, not I was, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And Jesus' whole argument is if God says hundreds of years after Abraham has died, I am Abraham's God and not I was Abraham's God, therefore Abraham must still be somewhere. He makes that entire argument there. And so this, this is crucial because if you've come here week after week, you know we go slowly. It took three and a half years to get through Luke. Um, we, we go slowly, we take the language seriously. And so this is the primary charge is that, okay, we, we're guilty of bibliolatry. And so I want to slow down and say, look, I am just trying to read my Bible the way Jesus reads his Bible. Jesus argues from small points of grammar. Jesus refutes his adversaries by tenses of verbs. And so I think it's fair and safe for us to do Likewise. Remember, the Jesus who says, turn the other cheek, the Jesus who says, love your neighbor, the Jesus who told the story of the the good Samaritan is the same Jesus who says in Luke 16, 17, it is easier for heaven and earth to pass away 
than for one dot of the law to become void. And you can't pick and choose because the only access we have to Jesus, the only information we have about Jesus is in the Gospels. And so you can't accept Luke or accept John or accept Matthew and Mark for the Jesus who turns to the other teach, the Jesus who teaches the Sermon on the Plain and the Sermon on the Mount, and then deny the same depictions of Jesus in those Gospels, of Jesus the inerrantist, of Jesus the one who said, it is more likely that gravity will not work tomorrow for the stars to fall from the sky, for heaven and earth to pass away, than for one of the smallest letters of the law to be void. That's what he says. These are radical statements. Absolutely radical statements. I mean, just think about that. Jesus is saying what God said in the Old Testament is of greater dependability than the laws of physics. That's what he's saying. Radical statements. And so I just want to read my Bible like Jesus does. I just want to view my Bible like Jesus does. And so I want to comfort you. If you're sometimes tempted to worry, are we being too literal? No, you're not. And we're in good company with one who's even more staunchly an errantist than any statement we could write. Jesus depended on the precise accuracy of Scripture. It is powerful. It is accurate. Um. And, and there's always going to be challenges. We're always going to feel the pressure to fit into the culture. Uh, right now, the pressure is the Bible's teachings on, on marriage and sexual ethics and gender. And, and it's been different challenges at different times. In honor cultures, in the East, that's not what offends them. Uh, our, our, our Muslim friends, our neighbors in the East, aren't offended by the Bible's sex ethic teaching. It's, they're offended by the Bible's teachings on honor in an honor culture, you do not turn the other cheek. In an honor culture, you avenge yourself. You avenge the family honor. And so Jesus' teachings about suffering wrong, not resisting an evil to return, that's what's offensive in the East, not our sex ethic. There will always be something in Scripture that is offensive. In modernism, it was the miracle claims. And there's always been attempts in the church to try to minimize the part of the Bible that offends the culture and what inevitably happens is not that the culture is converted, but those people who compromise are won over by the culture. So 50, 60 years ago, those Christians who were trying to minimize the miracle claims in the Bible, those schools, those seminaries are dead today. They didn't win the culture. The culture won them. And we don't need to be jerks, but don't be surprised. Consistently, there will be something in the unbelieving culture that Scripture teaches that will offend it. Now, we don't want to be inherently offensive ourselves, but do not be surprised and do not shrink back in fear. Do not feel embarrassed. You're in good company. Jesus himself again and again and again insisted on the accuracy of Scripture, trusted upon it, depended upon it, its power and its accuracy. We ought to go do likewise. This brings us to a final point. Jesus placed his own words. Jesus placed his words as equal to Scripture. So Jesus applied that radical statement in Luke 16, 17. It's easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one dot of the law to become void. And if you turn to um, chapter 21, he makes a similar statement about his own teaching. He has just finished teaching the end of days, the events that will accompany this second coming, making bold, accurate predictions of the future. Look at 2133. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Again, an incredibly bold declaration. I mean, someone who says this is either a megalomaniac or they're the real thing. Either this is God in the flesh speaking or this is someone to run from. Good moral teachers don't make statements like this. The genuine article, the one who spoke the universe into existence, he can say these things. Heaven and earth exist because of his word. His word. 
They continue to exist by, according to Hebrews 1, 3, are upheld by the power of his word. So he can say, yeah, my, my word has the same enduring power of the universe. He can say that. This also becomes the foundation, basis, warrant for the New Testament writings. Because, of course, it starts asking questions like, well, how will it be that Jesus' word will not pass away? Well, let's record this written down. This becomes, in part, the warrant for the New Testament writings. And so Jesus would have us take that same reverence, that same study, that same trust, that same um, confidence in the power of the Old Testament and God's word and place that same confidence and trust in his word. We, we have a sure word. God has not stuttered. Um, he has given his people his word and we have received the most revelation of all of his people. There are people who lived when just the Pentateuch was written. There are people who are lived just in the Pentateuch and some of them of the earlier prophets lived. We live with the full revelation of God and his word. We of all people ought the most to study it. So, so in application, I would just challenge you to ask yourself, and maybe ask yourself, have a discussion. If you're married with your spouse, does your life evidence that rigorous value and study of God's word? Are you studying it in any way like our Lord? Are you using it in your fight against sin like our Lord? Are you trusting in its power? Because if you are, then even though you haven't gone to seminary and even though you're not a pastor, if you can speak the truth and love to your neighbor, you have just as much power at your disposal and they're just as likely to listen to you as you speak the gospel to them as they would have Pastor Joel where the greatest evangelist you can imagine would. If they don't listen to the law and the prophets, neither will they listen if Joel talks to them. Neither will they listen if whoever. If we believe that, we would speak that. Jesus depended on the precise accuracy of Scripture, so should we. Do not doubt just because certain teachings of Scripture are out of vogue. Do not be embarrassed not be tempted to abandon them. The world's going to think what we believe is silly. Like we, should, <laughs> we should expect that. And the, No, no, I expect to be taken seriously. We shouldn't. It's foolishness to those who are perishing. It will always be foolishness, just for different reasons. And finally, we should likewise cherish, memorize, internalize, trust Jesus' words. As we turn now to the celebration of the Lord's table, it is precisely Jesus' words that tell us its meaning. I invite the men to come forward.